Good afternoon. Almost good evening. The plan of my dialogue with you is to try and discuss the issue of gender equity for women in STEM and what, you know, what the issue is, why do we want to change it, and what roles institution and society can play. So, you know, the first question that people can ask here is that what's so special about women in STEM? What is STEM? STEM is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Now, most of us would say that, yes, indeed, mainstreaming gender in all walks of life is a need of the hour so that we can harness the potential of almost the 50% of the humanity most effectively. But then what is special about women in STEM? Why do you want to talk about them separately? The reason is women in science, because of the demands of the career in science, in fact, have some very specific extra challenges and hence this separate narration. But then you can also ask me the question, who am I to talk about it? The point is that I have been, as was told, a woman in science doing theoretical particle physics for about four decades. And out of this, the last two decades, I have been involved in women in science. So that's my locus standi. Now, before I start talking of the subject, I want to tell you a story. I'm giving you this talk in this uh, city of Pune, which is called Oxbridge of Maharashtra. And in this city, in 1844, was the first school, vernacular school for girls that was founded by Savitri Bai Phule, after whom the university that's a few kilometers from here has been named. Then in 1886, the first female English school was founded here. And in fact, I am a student of that school many, many decades later. I was born in Pune, I was brought up in Pune, and I was brought up in a family with three other sisters with a mother and brought up by a mother whose father about a century ago promised her that he will not marry her, get her married before she finishes her school education. So what's the point of this all? The point of this all is that I actually studied and was raised in a city, in a family, which thought that women education is completely a rightful thing. But even then, education for a girl in science was not high priority. Because in fact, I did not study science till I passed seventh grade. So obviously it's clear that in times much before this and in places other than Pune, the atmosphere was even more discouraging for a girl to study science or for a woman to do science. But however, there were many, many impressive women who were not deterred. I think you have seen some of the pictures, photographs going around when I was being introduced. And one of them is the first Indian woman doctorate in science, Janak Yamal. She was also the first director general of the, uh, the of the Zoological and Botanical Survey of Independent India. Now this journey from a woman of an education from 1844 to women in science took about 100 years. Just to sort of set the stage, today you might have seen on Google, Google is celebrating the first paper published in Philosophical Transactions by a woman called Mary Somerville. This is the lady who actually defined what science means. This is just to set record as to where we are, what are the things happening in the rest of the world. Women in technology took quite some time, but when they arrived, they arrived with a bank. And this particular iconical picture of sari-clad, flower-wearing women congratulating each other for nothing else. What else? Wonderful and successful uh, uh, functioning of Mars Orbiter. But in spite of all of this, the fraction of women in science in India is a rather minuscule number. I'm a scientist, so I should give you real numbers instead of saying small and big. So here are the numbers. So in India, actually, the fraction of girls in education, and I'm doing only here undergraduate, masters, and PhD. I'm being elitist here. So you see that about 40, 40%, 30%, you see large number of women actually uh, go from undergraduate to 
the MSc to PhD, these this percentages are rather high. But now after PhD, what happens next? You see that in the postdoc level, there is a jump down. When I think of permanent faculty members, it goes down even further. And if I think in terms of women who are uh, high achievers or who are science administrators, it goes down to even further 4%. Again, if you look at today's Hindu, there is a comment by the current secretary of the Department of Biotechnology and the reporter has mistaken the gender of the department, of, department secretary. But of course, he's not to be blamed because in 95% of the times, he would, his, his or her choice of gender would have been right. On the other hand, my choice of gender for the reporter would have been right only 50%. So this kind of tells you really the small numbers of women in Indian science. This part is unusual to uh, 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 different from other countries. So in India, to, we don't need to attract girls to STEM. They come, they excel. But what we have to worry about is the steep fall. And this precipitous fall is what we need to worry about. This is what we actually share with the rest of the world. But this is where things are actually good with us. So some of you can ask that this loss of trained scientific movement power, why am I talking so much about it? OK, actually, I've heard arguments when people have told me, anyway, these women become very good teachers for their children. So this is a good use of their training. But actually, apart from the sheer injustice of that statement, I think it matters that we need to really worry about this fall for other very pragmatic reasons. Because this fall means that we don't get good returns for our investment. One rupee spent on a scientific work uh, research uh, training of a woman, we get back only 20 to 30 paise. And no country which wants to move on the path of innovation can afford to do that. So to me, this is just plain economic sense that we must avoid this fall. And more important than that, not, not more, but equally important, is the fact that inclusivity and the diversity in research careers actually brings in more to the research. And an example is, there is a artificial intelligence researcher, Joy Bolamvini, and she is in MIT. She performed research and she found that the algorithms, face recognition algorithms, fail 35% of the times when they are tried on African-American women. Why? Because the people who are developing them, white Caucasian males, trained them only on white Caucasian male photographs. I rest my case. So what I'm trying to tell you that stopping this precipitous fall is not just good for women, it's good for science, it's good for our country. So this is something we all must want to do. But then before we try to stop it, we need to know what are the reasons. And there are two very simple, uh, visible and obvious reasons. One of them is the one that I said is specific to science. What happens is that with any other degree, you get a degree, you start a job. You become a doctor, maybe in a two years time, you become a practicing uh, surgeon or a practicing uh, whatever you want to do. But with a career in science, it's actually after your PhD that your real work begins. You need to, you know, you need to set, establish yourself. You need to sculpt your own place. You need to find your own niche. And it is also the time when you must also have children because the body clock is ticking. So both the clocks are ticking. Science doesn't wait for anybody, but nor does the body. And that's perhaps one of the things that's very different for science, women in science than for anybody else. And then there are other reasons, which are family and career balance which are more or less the same for all the other sisters who are also trying to achieve something in the uh, career, uh, other spheres. And the family and career balance, I think, is really uh, something the various is controlled, more or less the challenges are controlled by our expectations and expectations which are actually reinforced by upbringing. And many of us think that this is all. I have produced this picture, which was tweeted by Mahindra. And you know, they already think that this is all that women, we need to help women to overcome. But actually, for first I told you, women in science actually begin a little bit before. So that's first problem. And the second point is, this is not all. This is not at all all. Why? Because there are many things which I call 
invisible bias. And not just I, Royal Society of, uh, in uh, London also has identified this. Now, what is this invisible bias? I can go on listing, I don't have the time. But I can tell you, in my opinion, all the invisible biases essentially are due to a lack of importance that society and scientific uh, community gives to women's participation in scientific research and a science career. Okay, that is really the point. The first point that is the, in the eyes of the society, since research is not important, you know, I'll tell you something simple. A mother-in-law will very merrily look after the uh, children when the daughter-in-law is a, you know, high-flown uh, gynecologist and who is invited in the middle of the night to deliver a baby and she will be even proud of it. But she will not understand why the same daughter-in-law has to go to the laboratory to look after her drosophila files in the, flies in the middle of the night. She would try to tell her to change her area of research. Okay, so that is what is the problem. The problem is also affects the mentorship that women get. I have seen examples of this and I have seen how positive or negative mentorship directly implies that a person will stay in the field and grow or go away. Role models are a third very important thing. And many of my contributors to Leelawati's daughters have listed help from extended family as well as equally well the, the mentorship from senior professional colleagues as two things that help them move onwards. So clearly it works. These are small things that individuals, institutions, people can do. And these are small things that help this stop this drop off. Another invisible bias is joint careers. Dual careers. In fact, the standard statement is, we do not hire couples together. In fact, two Nobel laureates that I know of, Maria Gopat Mayer and Rosalind Diallo, both of them actually were not immune to this problem. And it is this issue that I think the institutes can really be very sensitive to. This is something that the institute can look at very carefully. The third invisible bias that you can think about is also about lack of recognition or delayed recognition. I can talk about Rosalind Franklin, I can talk about Vera Rubin, I can talk about Jocelyn Bell. Not that these recognitions and awards are, they are important for the women concerned, but even more important is that the lack of these rewards reinforce the, you know, the import, lack of importance of women uh, science for women and women for science in the eyes of the society. And last but not the least, the in last invisible bias is the gender, um, I will not say just gender, but unequitable workplace, non-inclusive workplace. And here I don't talk only about sexual harassment, I talk about all kinds of gender harassment. And these are the different invisible biases that a woman in science has to fight, and many of these are specific to women. In so what's the cure? The cure is, of course, policies. The, and I have already talked about some changes in the mindset and some societal conventions. So let me tell you that I'm really, really proud that in India, we had some of the first enablers uh, that were introduced by the government, the Department of Science and Technology and Bio Biotechnology. And they were the majors to get women, allow women to come back after a break. And it has been flawed as it is, that system has been reasonably successful. In 10 years, the share of women in projects of Department of Science and Technology went on from 15% to 25%. So it works. But now the point is, what you really want is not to take a break and come back again because science does not wait. Obviously this policy was framed by not a web by a woman. The point is you need to involve women in such policy decisions. And what would be an ideal policy decision? That can you minimize the break, you know, career when you're going through these initial speed breakers? Almost all the contributors of Lilavati's daughter said, just help us getting a level playing field in these few years and after that we don't need any others, extra, you know, concessions. So this is something, and also another point is that one has to realize and make these policies as gender neutral as possible. Because bearing a child only a woman can do, but rearing anybody, everybody can do. In fact, 
I have seen my own, you know, closer to home, my own nephew arranging his flexible schedule because he had a flexi time job so that his wife, engineering wife, engineer wife can go back to work sooner after the young one was born where he can take care of it. There is a crash in ICER there. And again, he used to keep his child in that ICER uh, crash. And I have seen there many men coming and keeping their children. So crashes are not for women alone. Crashes are for everybody. So every measure that you introduce, the more you make gender, uh, gender neutral, the more chance you have of it being successful to arrive further. So this is about uh, the enablers. Yeah, about the crash, I wanted to tell you one more story. Just yesterday, last week, I was in a conference, and the award-winning entrepreneur, uh, Dr. K. Rajeshwari, actually said one of the big reason, things that she thanked was the crash in Tata Institute when she was there, a postdoctoral fellow, not a faculty. So these are small, small things that an institute can do, but it pays big, big dividends. OK? Uh, I should also, yeah, I think so. Th that is the point that I wanted to make. So now you ask a question next. Is that what, you know, what are the other, is there, are there any other points that we need to figure out when we are making these policies or when we are trying to change the mindset? And there, I want to give an example. And this example is that of an uh, invisible bias how an invisible bias feeds into a visible challenge. And this is based on a particular survey I had made, which said the loss of trained scientific woman power, what fraction are we losing and why? At this time, when we asked the women the, who had actually fallen off the cliff as to why did they jump off the cliff, they told us, yes, family was one reason. But other equally important reason was the unsupportive and rather inflexible attitudes by scientists, by institutions, and by individual, and by the social structures. So this gives you a clear way what institutions need to do. Institutions need to be welcoming to women who are trying to come back to career. Institutions need to look at the hiring policies more carefully and see that there is no bias. Institutions need to see where, how they can create a more inclusive atmosphere. These are the things that the institutes can do. And there are the similar things that scientists like me can do and remember and do well to remember that. And are there any blueprints of such programs which are run at the institutional level? One such program is the Athena Swan Scientific Women's Networks Academic Network, which is running in Great Britain. And I find it's a wonderful, wonderful initiative. It actually ranks the institutions based on how good uh, inclusive atmosphere do they produce at the institutions. And you know, science administrators always want to get high ranking, as a result of which many institutions have put in really a lot of efforts. And the proudly imperial college goes around saying, we are gold star Athena Swan. It works. It helps the women. So I think we have to think of doing something by way of an Indian version. So the end, what do we learn? The path to go to a situation we will just speak of scientists or engineers and not their gender surprisingly goes to the path of being very aware of the same for a long time. And that's the path we have to traverse. All of us, individuals, society, and the governments need to work towards this. Thank you very much.